Amen. God bless you all this morning. Good day to be in the house of the Lord. Let us all stand and open our service in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are indeed grateful for the time that you've given to us, Father, and Lord, for gathering us together this morning, Lord, to be able to hear your word and Lord, to be able to sing your praises this morning, Father. Lord, we just love you for what you do for us, Lord, and what you have done for us and what you are going to do for us, Father. And Lord, we just ask that you would be with us in our service this morning, Father. May everything be glorifying to you. Be with Brother Brian as he speaks this morning, Father. May you speak your words of life this morning is our prayer in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> in your only believe book, let's try it. 491, we haven't sung that in a while. We have come into his house. <clears throat> we have come into his house to magnify his name and worship him. We have come into his house to magnify his name and worship him. We have come into his house to magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Jesus Christ the Lord. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship Christ the Lord. Worship Him, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us lift up holy hands to magnify His name and worship Him. Let us lift up holy hands to magnify His name and worship Him. Let us lift up holy hands to magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Oh, worship him, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It's a good day to be inside and warming up with the Holy Ghost. Amen. <coughs> We finally got us a little bit of winter here in Ohio, so bless you all that are watching this morning that maybe couldn't be here, and uh, we'll go ahead and take our prayer request before the Lord. Does anyone have one they'd like to make known this morning? Amen. Remember Sister Patty for healing this morning. Amen. Continue to remember Brother John's mother in prayer. Uh, he was going to go see her here the other day and haven't heard how how he's uh, how she's doing. So just remember them in prayer. Brother Collins' family for healing, also for the Dolly family uh, for healing of the body. We have Brother John McCray in St. Paris, Brother Joe White, Brother Brian Chips, Brother Caldwell, Brother Frankus, and Brother Mabuka. And also we have uh, the needs in India and uh, Uganda this morning. All your unspoken prayer requests can be known by an uplifted hand, and we'll go to the Lord with prayer this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are indeed grateful to be your children this morning, Father, Lord, knowing that you have made a way for us, Lord, and that we were predestinated, Father. And Lord, we have these needs, Lord, that we've asked for this morning, Lord, for the healing of the body, and Lord, for the healing of the mind, and all those needs, Lord, that you know that we need, Father. And for you are the creator and you know us better than we know ourselves father and lord so we commit ourselves into your hands father that we could uh, cleanse ourselves lord now and be judged now lord and so that we'd have that spotless garment lord when you'd call for us and 
Lord, for the lifted hands this morning, Lord, and those that may be watching that lift their hands, Father, had a spoken prayer request, Lord, may you grant that to them this morning. Is our prayer in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Number 442 in your only believe book, Cause Me to Come. <clears throat> Cause me to come to thy river, O Lord. Cause me to come to thy river, O Lord. Cause me to come to thy river, O Lord. Cause me to come. Cause me to drink, cause me to live. Cause me to drink at thy river, O Lord. Cause me to drink at thy river, O Lord. Cause me to drink. At thy river, O Lord, cause me to come, cause me to drink, cause me to live. Sounds a little better now out here. Um, <clears throat> Brother Steve and Brother Steve, if you would come this morning, we'll take up our tithe and offering. Brother Steve Gray, if you would ask the Lord's blessing this morning. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for all that you've blessed us with, Father, which makes it possible for us to give back to you. We ask you to bless all that's given. May it be for your glory. We ask you. Amen. He is good to us. Amen. It's hard to believe that the uh, year is almost gone and uh, get to start another one, but hopefully he'll come for us this year. Amen. Number 77 in your only believe book, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. <clears throat> soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. 
death into life everlasting. He passed and we follow him there. Over us sin hath no more dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying His perfect salvation to tell Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in His wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. I had forgotten to mention some traveling mercies on our prayer request this morning. I remember uh, Nate and Becky, I believe they're probably traveling back today. And also for my brother and my little nephew, they just left this morning to go back to Arkansas. So uh, remember them in prayer as they drive on the roads today. And uh, <clears throat> Brother Brian wanted to mention that if anyone wanted to have a watch night service, that he would play a tape, I believe, or something uh, for tonight. And uh, I don't know if uh, it's, he wanted to show a hand, so he may ask you before the service is over. If you want to come uh, to a watch night service, just uh, let us know. And... Uh, then we'll go ahead and do that. He may go ahead and uh, play a tape anyways uh, to be online possibly. So <clears throat> let us all stand and we'll sing Only Believe this morning as we ask Brian to come. <clears throat> Only Believe Only Believe All things are possible only believe only believe only believe that all things are possible believe Jesus you're here Jesus, you're here. All things are possible now that you're here. Jesus, you're here. Jesus, you're here. And all things are possible now that you're here. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear gracious Father, we want to just tell you, Lord, how much we appreciate your having come down in this hour to gather together your children to a message to the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Father, we, knowing that as we live in this life, Father, we have so many issues that we have to deal with. Lord, the the way the country is being run, the way it's moving more and more into godlessness. And yet we have our families tucked away from, from the world and hidden in Christ. And so, Father, we just ask that closing out this year of 2017, I never thought we'd see that day, 
going back to 77, but yet we, we're here. And so, Father, we just ask that your presence would go with us into 2018. And may this coming year, Lord, be the year that we go home, the year that your rapture is fulfilled, the catching away takes place, the tent ministry or the ministry of the resurrection comes forth in its fullness, and the year that your bride becomes so conformed to the image of Jesus Christ that the whole world will no longer be groaning and waiting and travailing to see it, but we'll all see it. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> As you know, we've been studying on the topic of faith for the past 56 sermons, what it is, how it works, and to whom it is given. And then within this series on faith, we've looked now for the last three services on the true fivefold ministry and uh, having the faith to receive it. Now, in our series, we've shown you that Brother Brown defined faith as a revelation, something that has been revealed to you. We also have shown you that according to the Apostle Paul, there's only one Lord and one faith, and of course, that one faith is the faith or the revelation of that one Lord. Now this morning, I'd like to point out to you the fact that, uh, the, the, or excuse me, the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ is the foundation of our faith. And in fact, our faith in Jesus Christ and his word is our foundational faith, for it is the foundation of our entire life and our entire being. Now, from the stature of a perfect man, Brother Bram said, what is the foundation of Christianity? Faith in the Word of God. That's your foundation. Then you begin to grow. Then you start, you begin to add to this foundation. Therefore, we must understand how that God brings his faith to us in order to understand what makes up the foundation of our faith. In the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now the Greek word is heteros there, which means of a different nature. Then the Apostle Paul says, which is not another, which this word is allos, meaning a different one altogether. And he says it is not an allos, it is not a totally different gospel that you have been removed to, but it's a perverted version of the genuine. But there be some that would trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So you see he is warning us that there will be uh, some who would pervert the gospel of Christ and then he warns us severely by saying, but though we, now when I speak the word we, it means me and you, and, uh, oh, excuse me, okay, thank you. <clears throat> when we use the word we, he's meaning himself included in who he's talking about. Or even an angel from heaven, a messenger from heaven, Preach any other gospel unto you than that which has already been preached unto you. Let him be accursed. Now notice the severity of this warning because he's given, he gives the warning even to himself and even to any messenger from heaven who would come with a word that differs from what he had already laid out for us. And so it matters not if an angel comes down from heaven or if a prophet comes on the scene, if anyone teaches contrary to what the Apostle Paul taught as the foundation of our faith, then we are commanded not to give ear to that person. Now notice then what the Apostle Paul tells us next. He says in verse 9, As we said before, so say and now again, if any man preach any gospel. Notice, if any man preach any gospel unto you other than which you have already received let him be accursed so to be more specific the warning is against any man who would preach anything other than what Paul had already preached he will be cursed now you do not have to be a fivefold minister to qualify for this verse and you do not have to be a preacher to preach and the synonym for preach is to advocate to profess to pronounce or expound Therefore, I believe that there are many, many times more men who are not preachers that will be found guilty of expounding untruth than there will be found preachers doing the same. People want to lay it on the preachers all the time and say, it's the preacher's fault, it's the preacher's fault, it's the preacher's fault. No, it's your fault. If you give ear to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, it's your fault. You don't have to put up with that stuff. Now, I know people in this message who are against preachers, and they want to blame the preachers for all the ills that they've seen within the message. And I will agree that many preachers will be found guilty, but Paul is not just speaking to preachers here. He said, any man, yet they themselves are guilty of advocating, professing, pronouncing, and expounding things which are, not, which are contrary to what Paul taught. 
So it doesn't have to be a preacher. Paul didn't say any preacher who preaches contrary. He said any man who expounds other than I expound to be the truth sets himself up for the curse. And one of the things Paul expounded is that God has sent to the church a five-fold ministry, five gifts to the church. So to preach against that, you don't even have to be a preacher to, to be against that. You could be just a lay person, and, and you're guilty of expounding or professing or preaching other than what Paul preached. The Bible version called the message, uh, called the message uh, puts it this way, Galatians 1 and 6. I can't believe your fickleness, how easily you have turned traitor to him who called you by the grace of Christ by embracing a variant message. It is not a minor variation, you know. It is completely other, a, a, an alien message, a no message, a lie about God. Those who are provoking this agitation among you are turning the message of Christ on its head. Now let me be blunt. If one of us, or even if an angel from heaven, were to preach something other than what we preached originally, let him be cursed. I said it once, I'll say it again. If anyone, regardless of reputation or credentials, preaches something other than what you've re uh, received originally, let him be cursed. Now the Weiss translation puts it this way. If any man comes to you and preaches for the good news a message which goes beyond the limits of what you have heard from me, let him be cursed. So what Paul is talking about here is that there are limits or parameters that define our doctrine. And anyone who ventures beyond those limits will be under the curse. The Apostle John tells us the same thing in 2 John 8 to verse 11. It says, look to yourselves that you lose not those things which we have worked for, but that you receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresses or goes beyond the limits and abides not or does not remain in the doctrine of Christ hath or echoes not God. He that abideth or remains in the doctrine of Christ, he echoes both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed, for he that biddeth him God speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. So if the person is not echoing, which means to say the same thing, to, to reflect it back, He's, he's partaker of the evil deeds. Now we've heard from the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John that the doctrine of Christ has limitations to it. And the word transgress means to go beyond the limits and therefore you do not remain in the con confines of the doctrine itself. And of course we know those limits are, he says, he, he must echo both the Father and the Son. Getting back to what Paul said, he said, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I, please, if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel that was preached of me is not after men. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Therefore, to better understand the scope of the fivefold ministry, let's once again go to what Paul spells out, beginning with Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he, God, gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. For what? For the perfecting, that means the maturing of the saints. That's the first and foremost reason God gives us for sending his predestined gifts to the church is to bring the saints to the place of maturity in their walk. And then he asks for the work of the ministry. And we will talk about that in a little while because that is what each of the five different gifts to the church is supposed to do. And thirdly, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ. Okay, so there are three things. Number one, to bring the saints to maturity in the faith. Number two, to do the work associated with their calling. And number three, to build up the church. And this will go on until, he says in verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith, the revelation, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, a mature man, a fully equipped man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we see the purpose of the fivefold ministry is to establish saints in the faith. Now, I'm just going to deviate a little bit from my notes here and just say this. I've seen too much disrespect for the fivefold ministry. And some, some men, uh, well, I'll just say, no, no man deserves disrespect, okay? You respect the man, you respect the office. You might not like what he preaches, but you respect him anyway. But the problem is people want to put Brother, Brother Brown at, 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 a, at a level that you know that it's total respect total love total uh whatever and then they want to question every single thing coming forth from the pulpits today and i have a i have a bone to pick with that because that's not right 
It's not right from this sense. Brother Branham was a man. He said, I make mistakes. He said, but God's word doesn't make mistakes. It's the word. It's the word. It's the word. It doesn't matter if it comes from you, Brother Don, or Brother Nick, or, or you know, Brother Justin, Michael. It doesn't matter who it comes from. The word is the word. That's where we place our respect. That's where we place our trust. Is the person saying the same thing that God said in his word or through a vindicated prophet? Now, <clears throat> he says to give them the necessary foundation to build upon, which means they are to preach the doctrine of Christ, the faith of Christ to the people, until the people are thoroughly grounded and settled in the faith, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, you can say, well, so-and-so deserves our respect, but you don't really deserve our respect. Let me just say something about that. There was a certain woman preacher that attended Brother Branham's church, and then she broke off and started her own church. She, she became a woman preacher. She's still alive. She's about in her 90s today. She was the one that prophesied that, uh, that uh, uh, Sister Amita would die giving birth. You all probably know the name. Well, her mother was a, uh, a piano player at one time, I think, or something like that in the church. But you know, she used to criticize Brother Branham to his face. She used to argue with Brother Branham concerning Scripture. Now you say, who would dare do that to a vindicated prophet? She was doing it to her pastor. And that's the same attitude that many people have when they... They, don't, they look at the vessel. They don't look at God using the vessel. What we're looking at this morning is God, if God sends a person, God is obligated to go with that person and back them up. It's God's obligation. If it's his gift, if it's truly his gift, if it's not just a man who's got a leadership spirit on him and gets up and, and, and uh, takes control of a people, but if it's actually a ministry of God, God is obligated to back that man up with signs and wonders. Now, so I see the purpose of the fivefold ministry is to establish saints in the faith. To give them the necessary foundation to build upon, which means they are to preach the doctrine of Christ, the faith of Christ, to the people until the people are thoroughly grounded and settled in the faith, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Nowhere does the Bible tell us the purpose of the fivefold minister is to push a button to play a recording. And to teach that is false doctrine. And I'm just laying that out from the pulpit. Now, the stature of a perfect man, and it's not just one person saying it or ten people saying it. There's literally thousands of people who believe that. And that's false teaching. It's a false doctrine. From the stature of a perfect man, Brother Bram said, now, here's what we do. What's the first thing? We have to be born again. That's laying the foundation. Then after we lay the foundation, secondly, you add to your faith, add to your faith, he says, Peter said here, add to your, first you have faith, then you add virtue to your faith. This is the next column. First pour your foundation, that's faith, then uh, to your faith add virtue. Now, right there knocks a lot of us down. Yes, sir, yes. Add virtue to your faith. That doesn't just mean living a virgin life. You know, like a woman or a man or so forth. That doesn't mean, have nothing to do with it. The Bible said, we read over here in the book of Luke, where it says virtue went out of him. Is that right? If we're going to be like him, we must have virtue then. We must have it to be like him. So what is this virtue that went out of him? From the statue of a perfect man, he said, now, first you must have faith, and faith alone won't do it. You've gotten, Peter said, then add virtue to your faith. You must have virtue in order to add it to your faith. Now, it might be the reason that you don't have it because many churches of today teach that you don't have to have it or the days of it is past they don't have to have it only thing that you have to do is to join their church yeah days has passed virtue anyone knows what the virtue what the word virtue means see and we must have it if virtue went out from him to heal the woman that was sick he's expecting the same virtue in his church because he was our example and and if he had virtue to give to the people, he expects us to have virtue to give to the people. So what is virtue? Virtue is strength and power. Some of them don't even believe in the power of God. They say that's past. 
only thing you have to do is just put your name on the book, be sprinkled or poured or baptized or whatever more, and that's all you have to do. But Peter said here, add virtue. So there's got to be power and there's got to be uh, strength coming forth. And what is that? It's maturity. That's what it's all about, maturity. A little baby doesn't have power to walk, doesn't have the strength to walk. When it grows up, it can walk. Now, Brother Bram is speaking to us concerning what the Apostle Paul, oh, Peter wrote here. He said in 1 Peter uh, 1 and 2, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the, uh, which is God-likeness, through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. Notice, glory and virtue. Glory and virtue. It's not enough to have the mind of Christ, which is the glory, the doxa, the opinions, values, and judgments, but you've got to have the virtue, which is the maturity to handle that word. See? Whereby are given unto us a great and seeding promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and besides this giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. <laughs> now this virtue that the Apostle Peter is speaking of here was translated from the English word virtue, uh, from the Greek word arete, which means manliness or full maturity. That's where your power and your strength comes in. So you can see that it is not only simply faith, but a faith that is fully mature that God is calling us to. Children can have faith, but little understanding of what to do with it. But one who is fully mature in, in the faith is so seasoned in the faith that faith comes naturally to their way of thinking. In other words, you do not even have to think what to do, uh, what to do next. You just do it. You see, a little child, you know, when they're starting to walk, they, they have to think about taking that first step, you know, and, you know, and they've got their hands up and they're trying to balance themselves, and they have to think about having a balance. They have to think about, how do I walk? But a full-born adult doesn't have to think about balance, has to, doesn't have to think about walk. And a Christian, a um, fully mature Christian, doesn't have to think about, do I have a balance on this? You have it. It's just natural. Doesn't have to worry about, well, Am I doing this right in my walk with God? They don't have to even think about it. They just do it. It's just part of their life. A young child has to think how to walk and how to keep his balance, but a fully mature son doesn't have even to think about that. It just comes naturally to him. Now, Brother Brown said in his sermon, Fundamental Foundation of Faith, he said, Now, <clears throat> we hear so many people, they say, Well, if I only had faith. Faith doesn't mean long and drawn-out prayer meetings. It doesn't mean long fast. Faith is an unconscious thing. Your real faith, you're, you're unconscious of it. You don't know that the faith that you have got. It's an unconscious matter with you. Could you imagine Jesus questioning whether he had faith or not to stop the winds or steal the waves or have faith enough to raise Lazarus up? He never questioned his faith. Now, the first thing before you can have faith, we've got to have some foundation for our faith. There's got to be something behind it. And now we know that's the word of God. <clears throat> from Paul Moore and Locust and Caterpillar, he said, Now, one of the first things that I'd like to speak to you for these, uh, these next few minutes, after we have found that the foundation must be original, it must go back to the foundation, it must go back to where it was the vine. If something's wrong with it and the vine's not operating right, let's go back and find out what, what, uh, what's wrong. Now, one of the first things that I'd like to do, uh, uh, that, that I'd like to mention, is that something has, has gone away from the church. One of the main things is faith. The people don't have faith today like they had in that day. Some kind of a cankworm or some sort has got in and eaten off the, the lifeline of faith. They ch they've changed it. Today their faith rests upon some kind of a big church or denomination, or I'll just say some type of a creed or some type of a doctrine. But Jude told us, in Jude the third, he said, Beloved, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you. I have it here before me. He says, and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Not a faith, the faith. That was once delivered unto the saints. That was 33 years before this. This faith was delivered. In other words, he's saying, look, the faith. That, in other words, the faith that Jesus had. 33 years before. Now, for a stature of a perfect man, he said, now notice, we, you, you must be born again. And when you're born again, you can't be born again without having faith. Remember, faith is revelation. That's right. So you see, on my chart here, I got the very foundation. Faith is the foundation of all of it. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, 
He must be. And when you are a skeptic of the Bible, when you're skeptic in the word being right, you, you just might as well stay back until first that you believe it. What is sin? It's unbelief. There's only two elements that control the human being. That's either doubt or faith. One or the other. You're either possessed of one, uh, uh, excuse me, you're possessed of one that dominates your life. In other words, look, if you're doubting all the time, you're possessed by a doubting spirit. If you're believing regardless of the situation, you're possessed by faith. Just depends on how much faith that you have, how high that you can rise. But first, it's got to be faith. Now, let me stay on that foundation for a while. So we see the three elements of the fivefold gift to the church is first and foremost to preach the word to the people. Bringing the people to a mental recognition of the reality of the living God. I've always said this, the fivefold ministry can't give you a revelation. Brother Branham couldn't give you a revelation. You could listen to the tape, plug, the, you know, play the tape 24-7, and you can't get a revelation by listening to another man. You get it by, it comes from God. You see? But we can give you a mental understanding, or as Brother Branham said, a mental faith. We can give you a mental understanding, and then when the Holy Spirit quickens that to you, it becomes a dyna dynamic revelation, a divine revelation. All right? <clears throat> so the fivefold ministry can preach the word to the people, bringing the people to the mental recognition of the reality of the living God, and presenting the living word to the people that brings them into the faith or revelation of Jesus Christ. Now notice the Apostle Paul's admonition in 2 Timothy 4 and 2. He says, preach the word. That is the number one thing a fivefold ministry is to do, is to preach the word, not push a tape. Preach the word. Didn't say push a tape. You don't want to add to the scriptures. The scriptures said preach the word. Then after the primary purpose is to preach or teach the word, the Apostle Paul then says, be instant in season and out of season. Now, and that simply means to be present. To be available to the people in season and out of season. In other words, the five-fold ministry can never retire, nor just walk away from their duties, even though sometimes they wish that they could just run from it all. That also means that they just don't close down church services for any old reason, but they are to be there all the time unless God, uh, unless called by God to travel elsewhere to preach the gospel, or perhaps the weather is too dangerous for the people to travel. Brother Brown tells us in, from blasphemous names, you know, look, there's places in this message where the preacher, he, he closes the door, and for a month in the summer, he takes a vacation. Or for two months, he takes a vacation. Just closes up the church. What kind of a spiritual walk is that? You know, people that do that need the Holy Ghost. Now, Brother Brown tells us from blasphemous names, and the biggest part of our faith is mental faith. By hearing the word, it brings us to a mental recognition of God. But if this coming from above, oh brother, if it ever strikes us, there is a godly spiritual faith. Then what does that, uh, what does that faith do? That faith recognizes only the word. No matter what anything else says, it only recognizes the word. Because in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word is still God, and the word was made flesh and dwell among us. And when the word itself is pouring into our faith, our mental faith becomes a spiritual revelation. And upon this foundation, I'll build my church. See, not upon a mental conception of church joining or a mental conception of that, but upon the revelation. When them streams of grace is poured into that mental faith that you've got, then upon this, a spiritual revelation. I'll build my church and the gates of hell can't prevail against it. See, that shows that they would be against it, but it never will prevail. Oh, what a glorious thing. <clears throat> so it takes a dynamic, quickened by God, revelation. And as I said, the mental understanding or mental conception may come forth from the pulpit, from the preacher. But it's got to rest in you. And when the Holy Spirit waters that, when the Holy Spirit waters that, it becomes a dynamic revelation. Paul said, one plants, another waters, but God gives the increase. If God doesn't give the increase, it doesn't matter how much you plant, how much you water. Therefore, the ministry's main purpose is to preach the word and be available to explain to the people the revelation of Jesus Christ in order for the people to come to a mental understanding first, so that the Holy Spirit may come down and anoint or quicken that mental understanding by making it a divine revelation. 
Now, from his sermon expectancy, Brother Brown said, and if you come expecting to get help from God, God will meet your expectancy. He always does. Wherever you go, whatever you do, what, what you expect brings your faith. If you come saying, well, there's nothing to it, that's just the way that you'll go back home with nothing to it. If you come tonight uh, saying, well, if I don't get prayed for, I'll go home and won't be healed, that's just the way that you go. If you come here tonight saying, I come for one sole purpose, and that is to contact Christ for my body or my soul, and my soul, or my soul, you'll go home just as happy as, as you can be, for you'll contact Him. Now, no matter what the opposition looks like, Christ is the answer. Faith brings Christ. Notice, uh, could you remember? 80, 80 years old, white beard, white hair, and yet the, the old man went around telling people that he wasn't going to die. <coughs> excuse me until he's seen the Lord's Christ. What a beautiful picture of faith. Faith knows no defeat. Faith is perfect. Faith brings things uh, when, there is no, when there is no things to be brought. Faith creates. Faith takes away doubt, uh, uh, takes negative and makes positive. How beautiful. The old man had a basis for faith. Faith is not a mythical something mentally worked up. It's an absolutely fundamental result that happens in a person's heart. When faith is appropriated, then it is something in the person's heart, but it can't be based on, say, well, go, go touch the tree and, and you'll get healed, or you'll get well, or, or pay, pray to the post. It's got to have a foundation. And from expectancy, he said, now, here it is, and I want you to get it. How much more foundation could you place your faith on, on any level, than the Word of God? Basically, you've got to come to the place where you say, look, God said it, that's it. I stand on, on what God said, and, uh, and, I, and when I've done all I can do to stand, I'm just going to be found standing here. What more could you have put your, your faith in? When he said, heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away, then it is in fact uh, that God's word is eternal. And the very word w world that we're setting on, on top of tonight is nothing more than the word of God materialized. He spoke the word and said, let there be, and the world came into existence. All things that you see was made by faith in the spoken word of God. God said, let there be, and he believed his own word. Well, after redemption and a taste of God in our soul and our heart, how much more ought we to base our faith on what God give us for the promise for, uh, give us the promise for, and sent Jesus to die for, to redeem us uh, to that promise? Then I look at Simeon, the, old, the Holy Spirit revealed to him that he wasn't going to die until he seen the Lord's Christ. He had a basis for it. He wasn't afraid to testify. He knowed it was going to happen. Now concerning the main purpose of the fivefold ministry of preaching, uh, of preaching, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 and 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? Has not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. In other words, you could have professor's degrees and LLDs and PhDs and, 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 and just a whole list of things. It doesn't make you any closer to God. It doesn't even make you any better understanding of God because it comes by revelation. That's something that's between you and God. It's not between you and your preacher. It's not between you and your wife. It's between you and God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So I see that preaching brings salvation. And God has chosen a fivefold ministry to bring men to salvation through the preaching of the cross. From Believest Thou This, he says, And now it falls on my lot this afternoon to speak a little warm under the tent and I'm not a preacher to begin, be, begin with, but I, I like to talk on the Word. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the Word. That's what gives us faith. Before we can have faith, we must have a basis for faith. Isn't that right? Then if you, if you're go, if you was going to get married, you'd have, well, your wife would have to tell you that she loved you and how that she'd be true to you, and you'd have, have her word on that. And then your faith, it just depends on, on how you feel about it, if her word is right or, or, or all right or not. And that's the way we have to do by any, any way. By faith, we have to have a background, a foundation. And from perseverance, he said, and you've got to have faith in something. And the Bible said, faith cometh by hearing the hearing the word of God. That's the basis for it. Your faith has got to have a foundation because God promised it. 
So what I want to do concerning, uh, or look at this morning concerning the fivefold ministry is that you, you have to believe that God is using that ministry or you will never get anything out of it. You can come here every single servant, uh, service and just be you know, perfectly in tune with the singing and everything else, but when the minister gets up, if you don't have confidence that you're going to hear from God, you're not going to hear from God. If that ministry is going to do any good, you've got to, have, you've got to come expecting you just can't think that ministry could be there day and night, day and night, day and night, and, and you'll receive from it whether you doubt, it from, uh, doubt it's from God or not because faith doesn't work that way. And neither do, do the, gift of church, uh, 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 the gift of God to the church work that way. If the fivefold ministry is God's gift to the church, but the greatest gift is to get your own self out of the way so that God can have the preeminence, then how are you going to approach the ministry that God sends? It all depends on if you can get yourself out of the way. You know, people want the preacher to get himself out of the way, and that's true. I, I mean, I want to get myself out of the way. My greatest enemy is myself. But you've got to get yourself out of the way. <clears throat> if you're just looking at the vessel, you don't like the fact that he's bald or something like that, and that distracts your thoughts all the time, or you don't like the, the way he looks, or you don't like whatever about him. You, you've got to get yourself out of the way. You've got to say, Lord, I'm coming to hear you this morning. Help Brian to, to die to Brian and help me to die to me. From the invasion of the USA, he says, I sometimes I think of my ministry and, and I see people coming and I get in the hotel room and I say, God, who's the people coming to see? Me or you? See? Because if they're coming to see me, they're lost yet. Oh. Boy, we got to go see Brother Branham. You're lost. You're lost. He says, if they're coming to see me, they're lost. A lot of people in this message qualify with that statement. A lot of people. But, oh God, tear me down and take me away. I want to represent you, the one who will stand before someday with trembling hands and trembling feebly, feeble body looking at you knowing that my soul hangs by your decision so let us exalt Christ <clears throat> he wasn't a proud man he said you know how much God will miss me when I'm gone he said put your finger in a bucket of water and pull it out in the hole that's left in the bucket that's how much God will miss me and yet people want to throw away a fivefold ministry and say we got the tapes Play the tape. Then why is it that people can have faith to believe God sent us a prophet, but they can't have faith to believe God's word? That said that he would send us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He, God, would do it. Notice some are teachers because it's the Holy Ghost in them that's doing the teaching. Because the Holy Ghost is a teacher. Others are pastors because it's the Holy Ghost who is the chief shepherd in them that is shepherding. Others are sent as apostles because it is the Holy Spirit in them that compels them to go overseas and preach the gospel. And it is God in them preaching. And yet others work as evangelists because it is the Holy Spirit evangelizing through them. Brother Bram said in a sermon, Jesus Christ the same. He said, now notice, if Jesus did those things in that day, and he, and he has raised from the dead, and he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he's obligated to his word. Now his corporal body sits at the right hand of God. You believe that, don't you? But the Holy Spirit is here working through his sanctified vessels, plural. Notice this is plural. And God has set in the church what? First, apostles, then prophets then teachers, then evangelists, then pastors. Is that right? For the perfecting of the church. God has did it. It's not the preacher that preaches. It's God preaching through him. It's not the prophet that sees the vision. It's God speaking through him. I do nothing except the Father show me first what to do. From Jesus on the authority of the word, Brother Brown said, always be reverent during time of the service, especially when the healing service is going on. Be open-hearted and open-minded. Just say, Lord, now Lord, I'm here to learn. You come and teach me. See? And the Holy Spirit will teach you. If you come with a kind of a sarcastic criticism, whatever you expect to see, that's just what you'll see. 
If you come expecting to be disappointed, that's the way you, you'll get what you expect always. If you come to receive, you will be expecting to receive and you shall receive just what you expected to receive. God always does that. He sworn to his, uh, he sworn to his word. And now maybe some things might be said that would be just a little different from your religious teachings. You might be a Catholic or you might be something or other, uh, uh, other phase of religion or some Protestant that doesn't believe in divine healing. Whatever it is, uh, you look at it just the way that it is. But just look at it from the standpoint of God's word. In other words, it doesn't matter what you've been taught. Does the word say it or does the word not say it? That's it. And you've got to look at it the way God said it. From expectancy, he said, now, if you come expecting to get help from God, God will meet your expectancy. Well, what if I don't like the preacher? Don't look at the preacher. Look at the word of God. Look at the promise. He always does. Wherever you go, whatever you do, what you expect brings your faith. If you come saying, well, there's nothing to it, that's just the way that you go back home with nothing to it. If you come tonight saying, well, if I don't get prayed for, I'll go home and won't be healed, that's just the way that you go. If you come here tonight saying, I come for one sole purpose, and that is to contact Christ for my body or my soul, you go, you, you go home just as happy as you can be, for you contact Him. Now, no matter what the opposition looks like, Christ is the answer. Faith brings Christ. Now, could you remember 80, uh, 80 years old, white beard, white hair, and yet the old man went around telling people that he wasn't going to die until he seen the Lord's Christ. What a beautiful picture of faith. Faith knows no defeat. Faith is, uh, faith is perfect. Faith brings, uh, faith brings things when there is no things to be brought. Faith creates. Faith takes doubt away, takes negative and makes positive. How beautiful. The old man had a basis for his faith. Faith is not a mythical, something mentally worked up. It's absolutely, fundamentally, result that happens in the person's heart. When faith is appropriated, when it, uh, then it is something in the person's heart. But it can't be based on, well, uh, go touch a tree and this and that. It's got to have a foundation. And therefore, as Brother Brown said, from world falling apart, he said, our foundation of our faith lays in the written word. Now, the fivefold ministry are given gifts from God to the church. Therefore, let's read what the Apostle Paul says concerning how that we're to get anything from these gifts. In Romans 10, the Apostle Paul tells us the reason for God sending these gifts into the church. Romans 10, 14, he says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have you not all heard? Yet verily their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But did they hear? That's the question. Did they hear? The sound went forth, but did they hear? In Romans 10, he said, How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe on him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? In other words, what he is telling us here is that even though they say that they hear, they boast in vain, unless they, they hear a true preacher. For to hear a false prophet or preacher means as much as not to even hear, because what they're hearing is false. So they might as well not even be hearing it. They hear and they do not hear. They, they have ears but do not hear. In other words, <clears throat> Brother Steve, if you were to come to me and ask me to, you know, you call me on the telephone and say, you know, Brother Brian, uh, you know, can you give me some advice on my, uh, on my car? You know, this is not working, this is not working. Well, I'm not a mechanic. You know, Don would be the one to go to for that. And I can give you all the advice I want, but is the advice going to do you any good? That's what he's saying. If, they, if they're not a true preacher, God sent a preacher, then what you're hearing isn't going to do you any good anyway. Because it's not from God. It's from themselves. Or from their, from their organization, from their creed. That's what he's saying here. He says they hear and they do not hear. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor do they preach the word of God. So if they are not teaching it like Paul taught it, then it's another gospel and it would be better for those who hear not to hear. And then in verse 15 he says, How shall they preach except they be sent? Notice what Paul says 
uh, can be broken down into five statements. Number one, it is impossible for those to preach who are not sent. How can you call yourself a messenger if you weren't sent with a message? Remember the guy that in, in, in the Old Testament, David's son had died. <clears throat> and so I think uh, it was Absalom. And so I think it was Joab or somebody was giving instruction to a messenger. You know, he said, you know, I want you to go and I want you to run to David and tell him, you know, that, that, that his son has passed away. And, uh, you know, and, and so anyway, then another guy said, well, I'm faster runner than he is. I can do this better. He runs ahead. He gets to David and David said, you know, what's the news? What's the news? He said, all is well. Well, that's not all is well. David's son had died. Brother Bram called that running without a message. And how many men run without a message because God never sent them to begin with? You see? So it's impossible for those to preach who are not sent. In other words, if God didn't send the gift, then the gift is not from God. And not only that, but then what the person is teaching is not from God either. It's from his own self. Well, then how do you know if it's from God or not? God will back it up. The God that went with Jesus went in him. Jesus said the, the, the God that goes with us, is, or the God that sends us is obligated to go with us. Number two, it is impossible for those to hear who are without a preacher. In the second statement, Paul teaches that without a preacher, those who think they are hearing from God are not actually hearing anything from God at all. Number three, it is impossible that they believe who do not hear. And if they are not hearing from someone God sends, then they might as well not even be hearing, for what good would it do for them to hear what God has not sent? Turn on the radio. Hear all the denominational preachers out there. What good is it going to do you? They're teaching you creed. They're teaching you dogma. It's not going to do your soul any good. Unless you want to become one of their Baptists or, you know, whatever they are out there. Number four, it is impossible that they call upon God who they do not believe. And since they are listening, uh, they're listening, and since the one they are listening to has not been sent by God, then the person they are listening to has come with their own understanding and not with what God has said. And thus the one that they are pointing the people to is not a true God. Because if they don't even know God for God to send them, then how can they be pointing people to the true God? Every single Trinitarian preacher out there, I don't care if he's, uh, if he's a, a Catholic, Pentecostal, Jewish, because a lot of the so-called Jewish Messiah, you know, Messianic Jews, they're Trinitarians. They have no clue about what God is. They're Trinitarians. They have no clue what God is. How, how are you going to follow them? You're not going to follow them to heaven. You're going to follow them to hell. Because that's where they're going. Because they weren't sent by God. They're sent by their... Who knows? Their pocketbook. Since they're, they are listening, since people are, it is impossible that they call upon him who they do not believe. And how are you going to believe if there's, if the person, look, if the person comes and says, well, uh, you know, God, I met God on the pillar, you know, he's a, in the pillar of fire. Paul comes and says, I met God in the pillar of fire. The same one that walked the, the shores of Galilee, who is now in this pillar of fire. <clears throat> and, uh, and he told me, he brought this message. Now, Paul was sent by God. But Simon the sorcerer comes along and says, Hey, I like the miracles you guys got. How much uh, can I pay you to get that power? Simon Peter said, To hell with you and your money. That man wasn't going to help anybody's soul. He's going to help himself. You see? So it's impossible for them to call upon God if the one that, if no one was sent to them from God. All right? And thus, the one they are pointing the people to is not the true God, for they do not even know the true God. And therefore, if they are pointing the people to a false God, a false object of worship, like their church or their creed, then those who are hearing would be better off, would be, uh, would be better off not even heard and not even having been pointed to the wrong... Look, <clears throat> I just put it this way. Blanchester's in that direction. You go out the end of the street, if I were to say... Go that way to Blanchester. It's because I know where Blanchester's at. If I don't know where Blanchester's at, you go to the street and I can say, go that way to Blanchester, you'd be going in the wrong direction. 
What good will you do to follow the directions of a man who doesn't know what he's talking about? What good would it do for you to listen to a man who has no clue about God? Oh, he might have had some experience, but listen. I'm going to tell you something. As a Catholic boy, I went to the shrine in uh, Quebec, Saint, I think it's St. Anne's Basilica. People were crawling up 25 flights of stairs to get their healing, and many people got healed. And yet they know no more about God than a hot and tot knows about Egyptian nights. Getting their healing doesn't save them. Might help their body for a period of time, but doesn't save their soul. Finally, Paul says, It is impossible that they who do not call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So then the entire source and origin of salvation rests on this, that God sends out someone, a true minister of the word. For if God does not send out any, then they who are preaching are preaching falsely. And their preaching is no preaching at all. In fact, they would be better off had they never preached at all. Then they who hear would hear error, and it would be better for them not to have heard. Then they who believe would believe false doctrine, and it would be better for them not to believe. Then also they who call upon him would be calling falsely upon a false Lord, and it would be better for them not to call. For such preachers do not preach, such hearers do not hear, such believers do not believe, and such callers do not call, and they will be damned because they would be saved by falsehood. <laughs> now, so then why do people fill up the churches? I'll say this, entertainment. When they have an hour to two hours of singing before the preaching, the people didn't come for the preaching, they came for the entertainment. Brother Bram said one to two songs, maybe three at the most. And you go right to the word. It's always to be the word. But you don't find a lot of people wanting to go to churches where there's only two or three songs. Why? Because they're not coming for the message. They're coming for the songs. That's why they fill up the churches. It's entertainment. And it's not just been the last 40 years. Uh, I got Dr. Bollinger's book about it. He writes about it 100 and, uh, like 120 years ago. He said what has happened to the churches in America is that they've resorted to entertainment. <clears throat> Brother Bram came along 60 years ago saying the same thing. They, they're filling the churches with entertainment instead of the Word of God. So we read in Proverbs 128, Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. Then shall they seek me early, but they will not find me. For they have hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Then only they can preach with certainty who proclaim the gospel without error. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. By this quotation, the apostle shows that only those can preach who are sent by God. Those cannot preach the word of God and be messengers of God whom he has not sent and to whom he has not entrusted his word. So with this, with these same words, the apostle Paul points out the nature of spiritual peace and, and its gifts. These blessings are heard only in the divine word and are apprehended only by faith. They cannot be presented in visible form. The problem is that I see that many claim to be what they are not. And so they claim God sent them, and yet there is no supernatural evidence that God sent them. You had, in, 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 I'll just say it, in Lima, Ohio, you had a preacher up there who didn't believe the message, never believed the message, had problems with Brother Branham, had problems with things that happened concerning the message, and yet for how many years did he pastor a church of 300, maybe five, 600 people? Why? Because he had a lot of music. A lot of music. But he couldn't teach diddly squat. And when he tried, he tried, he sat and listened to Brother Valley, he tried, he tried to preach the Godhead, and he had a nervous breakdown because he couldn't do it. So those people sat for how many years not hearing the word of God, but coming to church anyway? I'm sorry, but it's not a picnic, brother, sister. We should come to examine our soul and to catch something from God that's going to help us. I believe that if God sends us a fivefold ministry, then God is obligated to back up what that person, what he sends. And that is what Paul meant when he said, For the work of the ministry, for it is God that worketh in us, both to will and to do his good pleasure. And thus it would be also God working in the ministry as well. 
from where he is the king of the Jews, uh, where, where, where is he king of the Jews? Brother Brown said, what our pulpits need today is not this here perfume religion. It needs the truth. The truth. Preach it from the Bible. Don't make any different interpretations. Just say it what the Bible said. God is obligated to his word. If he doesn't back his word up, then he is not God. Or is not his word one. Excuse me. It's not his word or one. Uh, but he will, he will care for his word. Now, from God making his promises, God is obligated to his word. And you're obligated to your word. And if you profess to be a Christian, you're obligated to live a Christian life. As long as you're going to church and professing to be a Christian, you're obligated. If you don't, then people can't trust you. <clears throat> and if it ever got to the place that God wrote something in his word and would, and, and, would not, and would not, you couldn't trust him to take his word, then he isn't God no more to you. Now, in other words... In other words, live the life. You're going to preach it, live it too. From God's gifts, always find the place. And now notice, we find that if, if he identified, now the works that he did identified that he was deity. Show, uh, show that, showed that he was. For he said, if I do not the works of my father, then don't believe me. And could not the Christian say today, if I do not the works of my Savior, believe me not. How many are Christians in here? Could not you say, if I do not the works of my Savior, believe me not? Your testimony should be received based upon the evidence that God is with you. Not who you claim you are, who he's claiming you are. The Spirit bears witness with your spirit. See, as the Father sent me, so send I you. And if, if you did the works creation works of the Father that sent him, then it's a creation. The Christ, the Creator, that sends us does the works of Christ, the Creator. See, as the Father sent me, so send I you. And if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not, then the Christian today has got to do the life that Christ did, or we have a right to say it's not so. Like Brother Brian would complain so often, he said, "Go to these, you know, there'd be meetings, be, you know, in the same building that we're having ours in, and and we'd be get, get there early to prepare, and and uh, you know, their, their preacher would preach so long, and then he'd have a smoke break, and everybody go out and they'd smoke on their cigarettes, showing they're not even Christians to begin with. So why were people going in there and paying their tithes and everything else to support something that's not even from God? From five identification of the true Church of the Living God." A brother asked, John 14, 12, he gives the teaching what the church should do. In John, the 14th chapter, 12th verse, uh, we'll see what that says. John 14, 12, so we read it, make it official. All right, John 14, 12, verse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. That's the message of the church. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, living in the church. King of the church, raised from the dead, same yesterday, today, and forever, performing the same works, doing the same things that Jesus did. That's the message of the church. And if the church isn't teaching that, it's teaching some false theology. That's what Jesus commanded them to preach. So if that is not taking place in this church, I'd expect you all to leave. But I've seen too much evidence that God is doing. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, let me emphasize again. He said, if the church isn't teaching that, it's teaching some false theology. So what did a vindicated prophet say? John 14, 12 was? From a sermon, take on the whole armor of God. William Bram said, John 14, 12. Jesus said, he that believeth in me, the works that I do, shall he do also. What is it? It's God in the church in these five predestinated offices backing up every word that he said with the Holy Spirit himself in there, which is the word made manifest, proving his resurrection, proving that he lives. All other religions are dead. Their forms are dead. There's only one that's right, and that's Christianity, because Christ is a living in the church of Christ, amen, making his word manifest, for he is the same. If it's the same word, it'll do the same things and show the same works and the same signs. Matthew 28 says, uh, be with his army in them, securing them. Think of it. The great word, general, triumph in us. 
<clears throat> so if you've got a five-fold ministry that claims to be a five-fold ministry and the works of Christ are not being there, it's not from God. I would not, for one minute myself, sit in a church where I did not see the signs and actions of God in the ministry that I was sitting under. I wouldn't do it. Now, it's going to be done 24-7 every day. That depends on what if God wants to do it 24-7 every day. Jesus said the Son can do nothing but what he sees the Father do, and that which the Father does, the Son does likewise. I've seen too many times, especially overseas, but I've even seen it in this church. I've seen God change weather. I've seen God heal the sick. I've seen God do many things. That's God. Show me a true fivefold minister today who has these signs following his ministry, and I'll show you a ministry that fits the pattern of the early church. That is a ministry God is backing up with signs and wonders like he backed up the apostles in the book of Acts. So he says, John 14, 12, what is it? It's God in the church in these five predestinated offices. Backing up every word that he said with the Holy Spirit himself in there, which is the word made manifest, proving his resurrection, proving that he lives. Christ is a living in the church of Christ, amen, making his word manifest, for he is the same. And if it's the same word, it'll do the same thing and show the same works and same signs. So, are we preaching the same word? I believe the reason why God came down with those three rainbows like he did with William Bradham is because we're preaching the same thing. If we weren't preaching the same thing, why would we get the same results? Why would God do the same thing for me that he did for William Branham if I wasn't preaching the same thing? Got to be a hypocrite to back up something that was off the word. Now, why isn't this being taught in the message churches? <clears throat> it's because it's not manifesting in their own ministries or in their church circles or camps. If it was, they would most certainly be teaching it. From why I had to be shepherds, Brother Branham said, now notice he said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. The Father that sent him went in him to confirm the word. And the same Jesus that sends his people goes in the people that he sends. That's saying, the works that I do shall you do also. Sure. He prayed that we might be one, one with him, not one with an organization, not one with a system, but one with God. For God and his word is one. And Jesus and God was one. And you and I and, and the word must be one. That's right. We must be one in agreement with the word. Not, not what somebody else says. This is of no private interpretation. Take it what it says and believe it, and God will vindicate it and prove that it's right. You think that it's just for disciples only? Take his word for it. Try it once and see it. I challenge all of you. I challenge every one of you. Try it. Lord, you said this. I'm going to step into it now, and I'm, going to, I'm, I'm waiting for you to perform. <clears throat> Brother Ram said, look, he said, if I, if, if I shoot a hundred times and out of one of them fires, he said, I'm going to keep shooting because I know that, the, that it's right. You know, you might get a, a boulder or two that, that doesn't hit the charger right. Just keep shooting because there's one that's bound to hit. You've got many scriptures. I've given you books, 800 promises of God. I challenge you to search through those books for things that you desire in your life and hold God to his word. Give him back his word. Say, Father, you said it, not me. You said these signs shall follow them that believe. You said, Father, whatsoever you ask in my name, I'll do it. You said it. Now I'm holding you to your word. And here's a promise. I have need for this. I have need for this. It's not just a want. It's an actual need. Now I'm holding you, Father, because you said what man that wouldn't, uh, uh, you know, if his son asked for, uh, for fish, would give him a rock or a stone. I'm not asking even for a fish, Father. I I'm asking for the salvation of my children. I'm asking for you to fulfill the promise that says, and all their offspring with them. That's what I'm asking for. <clears throat> all right. From the Messiah, Brother Brown said, they look like him, they act like him. They are his flesh, his blood, his spirit. Amen. That's the way God's church is. His eaglets, his messiahs. They look like him. They act like him. They preach like him. They do the works that he did. The things that I do shall he do also. More than this shall he do because I go to my father. Amen. The signs shall follow my eaglets. Amen. They'll do just as I do. 
If my spirit's in them, then they'll do the works that I do. If they don't do the works that I do, it's because my spirit's not in them. So, if the spirit's not in them and they're not doing the works, no wonder they're not going to talk about doing the works. Right? Now, that's a very strong statement from God's prophet, and it behooves us to lay before God's word and ask him to so fill us with his spirit and to die to self that what the people would see is Christ in you, the hope of glory. From a sermon, God's identified by his characteristics. Brother Brown says, John 14, 12, He that believeth, Jesus said, On me the works that I do shall he do also. Now look, he that believeth on me, a true believer, the works that I do shall he do also. Notice, in other words, like this, He that believeth on me shall be identified by my characteristics, the works. Now, that's what he did. He said, if I don't do the works of my Father, then don't believe me. And the Father spoke to the prophets, and that was their characteristics, their identification. So was it with Jesus, and he promised to him that believeth, my characteristics shall do in him just as it did in me. So you claim to be a Christian, you claim that you got the Holy Ghost, then pray to God to manifest that through your flesh. In a sermon, prophet like unto Moses, he said, aren't called by the church or so forth, they're chosen by God. Apostles, secondary prophets, third, I, I, I may not have that, these lined up right, but third, I think, is teachers and evangelists and pastors. Five, spiritual offices in the church to set the church in order. Apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors. Those are called offices by God. Then in the local uh, congregation, there's nine spiritual gifts at work among the people. Now, in these offices and places, in the office you hear from the apostle, his ministry, you hear from the prophet, his ministry, from the evangelist, from the teacher, from the pastor, each has a separate ministry, and their ministries is of God. God has set them in the church for this purpose. And the God that set them in the church is there with them. For it is him that worketh in you, both to will and to do. So if you're coming, as Brother Brown said, if the people are coming to see William Branham, they're still lost. If you're coming to see Brian Kosorek, you're definitely lost. But if you're coming to see God, you'll get what you're looking for. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your gifts to the church, for your word, for the perfection of the saints, which means the maturing, for the virtue that comes after our faith, which is the maturity, Help us, O oh God, to be those sons of God that are called for the adoption, for the placing of sons. May the whole world stop their groaning and travailing as they see your sons of God manifesting son of God attributes and characteristics. Help us, O oh God, to just walk in the light and to lay in the presence of the Son and help us to ripen that we might go home. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, let's just sing that song. I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that <clears throat> which I have committed unto him against that I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that 